Hello and welcome to this event for the British Film Festival brought to you by the British Council. Many of you will have seen The Warrior, the directorial debut of Asif Kapadia. It's the winner of two BAFTA awards and since then he's directed three narrative features and three feature documentaries as well as many shorts. Amongst his documentaries are Maradona, Senna, which is the winner of another BAFTA award, and Amy, which won both a BAFTA and an Oscar for Best Documentary Film. So welcome, Asif. Hi there. Hi, Ian. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I mean, considering everything that's going on, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, it's nice to be talking about The Warrior, 20 years on from making it. So I, I watched it again for the first time in, I think, about 10 years the other day. Um, and the word that kept coming back to me throughout the whole thing is timeless. The, it is this extraordinary um, sweeping film that just feels as relevant now and just feels as fresh now as it was when it was first made. Can you talk a little bit about the, the, the whole genesis of the project? Um, I, I, you know, grown up in London and making short films and being part of, wanting to be part of the British film industry, um, I just realised that as someone whose background is from India, uh, my family were born in India and came over to England in the 60s, but I was born in London. I've always, I speak more than one language. I had been a couple of times to India by then, not much. And I just was a, loved movies and I loved world cinema. And I, I saw a lot of films um, that I, really inspired me from China at the time, the kind of Yang Yimou films. Um, Wong Kar Wai was like the probably most cutting edge kind of filmmaker at the time. I saw a film by Tran Un Hung called Cyclo from Vietnam, French Vietnamese film. So it was a lot of Italian cinema, French cinema, Sergio Leone, films like that that I really loved. And so when I got the chance to make my first feature, I had written a kind of more obvious first film set in London, which was very personal, which people liked. And they thought, yeah, that's what you should do because it's your first film. And then I had this other crazy idea of making a samurai film. And even though it was much more difficult and much more complicated and on paper more expensive, everyone loved that script more because it was original. And so the samurai film, which I then rewrote to India, became my first feature. And a lot of it was just to do with the fact that I didn't want to do a, <clears throat> excuse me, a Cockney gangster film, which a lot of people were doing at the time. I wanted to do something that I loved and I wanted to go and see it at the cinema and also films that inspired me, which were quite epic in nature. You know, the David Lean style of filmmaking. So that was really the dream, was to make that kind of movie and to write that kind of movie, but very visual, very little dialogue tell the story with pictures, work with non-professional actors. And in the end, we got very lucky. I, I met a, a fantastic actor, Irfan Khan, and it was his first international film. And, and you know, it was a beginning, that film was a journey, beginning of a journey for many of us. All, a lot of people worked on that film, it was their first film, and it kind of started their careers off, really. And there is a link between that film and your student graduation film, The Sheep Thief. Um, could you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yes, so, so my graduation film from the Royal College of Art, I made in 1997, and um, it was my first kind of international film. And, and really, it was, it was The Sheep Thief that was the one that set me off and this idea of wanting to make world cinema, wanting to make films not necessarily English, um, where you don't know by looking at it who the star is, therefore you don't know how it's going to end. And that's how I felt very much at the time. Um, but, and it was my problem at the time with US cinema, particularly, um, and British cinema often has tried to copy American cinema, tried to appeal to them, whereas I was really interested in looking eastwards. Um, and so The Sheep Thief was made with non-professional actors, street, a street kid, uh, a pit pocket was the lead character. It was about 25 minutes long. It was the longest short film I'd made at the time. And um, it was a really tough, real challenge. Um, but it was, I wanted it to feel naturalistic. I wanted it to feel almost verging on documentary-like, but it also had a magical realism element. And I love this idea of films which are slightly elevated as something going on which is sort of um, otherworldly and spiritual. And so The Sheep Thief was the first real attempt to kind of do that internationally. And because of the success of The Sheep Thief, which won a prize at Cannes and won many awards around the world um, and, and was noticed by the industry here in the UK, got me an agent, got me my first kind of little bit of money to write a script. That's what naturally then led to me to push it even further with The Warrior. So... Anyone watching The Warrior, um, 
and has has ever seen any of uh, the Jidai Geki, the, the the kind of the samurai period, Edo period um, action films, might recognize elements in the early stages of the film of of that influence. But you mentioned just then about spirituality, about about kind of a higher idea. What's really fascinating with the film, and if anyone is watching this and yet to watch the film, you might want to skip this bit because it's a bit of a spoiler. Mm -hmm. You, one would expect a revenge drama. One would expect the carnage that you get with a samurai film towards the climax. And what you do is completely different. And it's, it, it's just very interesting that this spirituality becomes a bigger thing as the film progresses. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm anti war and um, anti-violent and so in a way one of the key things i feel is if you're going to be a filmmaker you've got to make the films that say what you believe in you've got to create the art that is what you want to say to the world not what you think everyone wants to see so for me even though it's called the warrior the original working title was the coward it was about the tough guy who which i thought was a good western title the coward but Somehow on paper, when people got to read 50 scripts and they look at the coward, they're like, I don't want to read that. The warrior, oh yeah, I'll read that. You know, it's one of those things where you've got to sell yourself. You know, I haven't made a film yet. And, and the idea was, he is somebody that is this tough guy who's a killer, who's a hired hand. He's the strong man for this feudal lord who at the, at the most important moment when he sees something that's going to happen to his child, can't act and becomes impotent and, and then goes on a journey of not wanting to kill because he makes a promise he, he he gives up the sword and that that idea of what happens if you don't go to the easy thing which is pick up a gun and just go bang 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 you know which is what a lot of films are or can be they're the films that really interest me um and that's that's the the references for me are kind of Bresso or um Ogetsu by Mizuguchi and then the kind of Chinese cinema and so this idea is where everything kind of is internal and there are very few moments of, of violence and hopefully when they do happen you remember them and you feel them. You don't see any blood, um, the, kind of it's always implied with like a red turban on the ground or something like that. So the idea of telling the story visually but using kind of metaphors and also just it to be told by the story of the character's face. Irfan was the person, everything you see is in his eyes, everything you see is in how he plays it. Now the idea that I was going to ever find anyone who could do this was always like a gamble. Um, but that was the kind of, it's really, I look back at the film and, and really sadly, I suppose we're talking here in 2020, um, in December, uh, earlier on this year, Irfan died, which is the reason why I watched the film again, because it was shown on TV and I had to do a couple of interviews. And there's no way this film could work without him. You know, it was one of those things where to meet Irfan at the point when he was thinking of giving up acting, he wasn't known internationally. He'd never made a film outside of India. In India, he wasn't considered good looking enough to be a movie star. So he was like the bad guy. They'd zoom into his eyes and make him look like a nutter. And then he's like one of the great actors, you know, and I can remember the day that we met and I can remember that journey we went on. And he was amazing. You know, he went off to be in many, many films and worked with incredible directors. And, but he always remembered the warrior. He always looked out, back on it as the point that his life changed and his career changed. And, for me, it's like I can write a line, I can have a script and a concept, but it doesn't work until you find the talent that elevates it. And it was the first time I really felt I worked with an actor that could take two lines and turn it into cinema. And I'd be sitting on set and the crew would be there when he'd do something just with a look and you'd go, I, I can't, how, can I, how can I even explain to him what, what I felt just then, you know? Sometimes I'd miss it. I'd have to say the true art of, of, of movie acting is sometimes I'd be staring at him and I'd look at it and I'd go, okay, we should do another one. And this is 20 years ago. We've got to talk about this, Ian. This is on film. This is super 35 mil. We had no video assists. There was nothing digital on this film at all. It was shot on film, edited on film and projected on film. And then eventually we did a bit of editing on an avid. There are no VFX, right? This is the old world of filmmaking. We're in the middle of the desert. Every piece of electronic equipment blew up, right? So literally, I would get a fax of shiny paper a week after I'd shot and from my editor in London who would say, rushes look good. Maybe you need a close-up for scene 2B. And that would be it. 
Like there were no no executives on set, there were no producers around. It was just us in the desert and in the Himalayas making a movie. And it was just the best. It was the best experience. And um, it's so different now, you know, it's so different now. So I'm really glad that that film is a style, you called it timeless, which is nice. That was the intention. It's a film from the old fashioned way of making cinema about the old fashioned way of cinema in terms of pacing, in terms of characters, in terms of performances. And everything since then got more complicated or changed and became what is now the new version of cinema, you know. And just coming back to Irfan Khan, I, I think there's what is so fascinating his, uh, about his performance is understanding that you can create the highest drama out of stillness, but also... Less is more. Yeah, but also having, when you really have an incredible actor, they don't have to do anything to be imposing. So when someone recognizes them, they don't have to show the physical threat. Yeah. It's just their sheer presence on screen alerts other people what they're capable of. It's literally a look. It should be, can be really violent. If, if done the right way, and if the camera's in the right place, and if the sound and the music does what it needs to do. So for me, it was like <clears throat> the coming together of all of the elements. You know, there are some sequences in there which are still probably my favorite sequences. There's, well, I don't know, if we, are we supposed to give away spoilers at all? No, at no, go point? ahead, go ahead. <laughs> well, there's a point when my, my favorite sequence probably in the film is the sequence where Irfan is in the crowd witnessing his son being questioned and being asked, is this your father? And his son is shown a head. And that sequence for me, Irfan doesn't say a word. He screams as a guttural scream at one point, but the rest of the time he's just looking and reacting. And it's what the camera's doing. And it's what the score is doing. And it's what everyone else is doing in a set piece. And you know, that sequence can only work because we're, it's 45 degrees in the desert where we're shooting it. And we, are, we don't have any kind of like, you know, there's no trailers, put it that way. And, and to have everyone in it, and the first AD, Guy Healy, was a genius. who could organize the crowd and you have a brilliant cinematographer and you're a brilliant operator. Georges Diane was the operator who did Lahaine and he did a lot of the kind of French cinema of that period that was very influential. And then the DP, Roman, it was his first big feature, you know, and the score is by Dario Marinelli who won an Oscar for Atonement a few years later. It's just this amazing mix of people coming together, but Irfan carries it and the young kid you know, there's a lot of young kids in this film who have gone on. One of them was a street kid who lived on a train station platform. One of them whose family were in the kind of arts. He's gone on to become a movie. They've all gone on to become movie stars now, all the young kids as well, you know. Um, the person who's actually the bad guy in the film is is um, kind of the, the right hand, the sidekick for Irfan in the film. I know. He was actually a stuntman. I couldn't find... Irfan could act fantastically but he wasn't very physical so when we were casting it i felt we needed the opposite to be the sidekick we couldn't just get two brilliant actors neither of whom could ride very well or use a sword so what we did is we cast our stunt director so i know is one of the stuntmen so he does all the physical stuff and then irfan can act and so they, they became a really interesting double act where so i know would be able to help irfan when something was a bit difficult for him so he's the guy who's like holding the sun and, and asked him, is this your father? So uh, it was an interesting kind of other little subplots going on. Um, what's really great as well for the audience is watching this both in Ukraine and in Armenia during the two British Film Festival weeks. Um, there are many of those people who will recognize Irfan because both the Film Festival in Yerevan and Odessa Film Festival shown, uh, showed the lunchbox, Ritesh Batra's yeah. film a number of years ago. And I, I still think Irfan, for me, his finest performances are in the lunchbox and in this film. I, I think they're quite, quite wonderful. What's great about the film as well is that this is a British film and some people might say, really, is it? But it, I think it, what we're trying to do with this British Film Festival this year is show films from the last 20 years because it does throw up the question of what is British cinema and it's much, much wider than people yeah. ever credit it for. Do you know, there was another thing going on in the background, which is I'm British, I'm a Londoner, I was born here. You know, all of the crew may well be from somewhere, but they all live in London or in Britain. My producer actually was French. He lived in Paris, but he said, I had to find a French producer to make this film because nobody in the UK wanted to do it because they didn't get it. Why? Because he spoke more than one language, because he was a traveler. 
you know, you can understand the industry has changed so much in the last 20 years. At the time, the idea of making a British film, which had no white people in it, who had a lead actor who was Indian, to make it entirely on location in India, but it was still British. And it was nominated and won the best British film, BAFTA. So it was, in its own way, it really was groundbreaking. A lot of films came after. Slumdog came after. Um, Michael Winterbottom made some films that came after. You know, at the time, British films that were abroad, the lead actor would have to be a white guy. You know, the, the kind of main character who drives the action forward has to be like someone that looks like the people who are commissioning the film. So a lot of people took a big gamble on this movie, you know. It was really filmed for Paul Webster, who used to run the film for at that time. A lot of people who had liked The Sheep Thief saw that, and this film was not big budget. This film was the same budget as a typical British film that could have been made in a studio with three people in one room. That's what the budget was. The idea was to take that money and go somewhere where your money goes a lot further. And in the end, the reason we didn't shoot it in Japan is Japan would have been very expensive. I don't speak Japanese. I don't know Japan at the time I had not been there. Um, but if I went to India, I knew that a couple of million in India, I could push and make something really epic. And that was, that was a big part of it. So we filmed for 11 weeks, six day weeks. It was a really long shoot for somebody who'd only ever made a short film before. Um, you know, there's a crew of nearly 400, 500 people on it at times. So it was a massive unit. That's because in India, if you hire a light, it comes with a man. If you hire a generator, it comes with 15 men. So you have a massive crew, even though, like, in front of me, there's two people in the desert with natural lighting. Behind me, there's 500 people. So it was, a, it was a big endeavor. It was an incredible kind of experience. But yeah, the idea for me was to push the boundaries of what a British film can be, you know. And, and I know a few people questioned it, but generally, I feel the industry really went with it. You know, it had a lot of love from the British film industry. It had a lot of love from people saying, we should be able to make this. And they did sort of celebrate it. Um, you know, that, that idea of language. Um, what's interesting is the film was selected as the British entry to the Academy Awards by BAFTA. So it was the, one of the first times a British film had been made, not in it, in, in in, because normally it's Welsh films or Gaelic yes. films that were being entered. So we were entered into the Oscars. And, um, and then the Oscars disqualified us because they said it was made in a language not indigenous to the country entering it. So, that, so we made the list and then the, Oscar, the Academy disqualified us. It was only next year when Michael Haneke made Cachet and they were thought, hold on, this is really not a good rule, is it? Because that was a, entered, I think, by France or yes. by, by Austria, but it was a French language film. And then they thought, oh, right. So the year later, they changed the rule. So that's we annoying. got kicked out and they got kicked out. Yeah, it is annoying. But that's, yeah, but you're kind of pushing boundaries, things like that happen. You but know, that, we were really trying to push the idea of what is British. But that's a, that, that's a similar thing, the pushing boundaries that you've done with documentary as well, the documentary form. Yeah. Because I, I, you know, I was one of the many, many people who saw Senna in the cinema when it came out and thought, wow, okay, hold on. This is like going back 20 odd, 25 years to when Errol Morris made The Thin Blue Line in the late 1980s mm. and thought, hold on, that's not a documentary. Well, it is a documentary, but yeah. it's something different. And we, we're showing The Imposter in this festival, which is another film that does a similar thing. But Senna was this groundbreaking yeah. thing that you since followed up with, with Amy and Maradona. And um, could you talk a little bit about this balance, the sort of the juggling between narrative and documentary feature filmmaking, or do you just see it as hey, I'm just a feature filmmaker, no matter what the form. Definitely just a film, feature filmmaker, but there is an idea which is like, in a way, the fiction films, like The Warrior, were trying to push the rules and push the boundaries, but also um, were playing with a lot of naturalism. You know, a lot of what was, goes on in, in The Warrior is a street kid who has never acted before, who, who's, who's illiterate, and therefore I'm telling them, a bit like a kind of Ken Loach film, day by day, this is what we're going to do and you just be you, and my job is to shoot it, um, mixed in with a really experienced actor. The Sheep Thief, the short film I made previously, even more so, because nobody could read the script. So, you know, I spent ages writing it, but I knew what the script was. We tried to shoot it chronologically. We had lots of children, lots of villagers who were in it, and they just had to live their life, but then I would nudge them in a certain way or a certain form to get the story. I, the idea of making world cinema is really what I love. I think it became harder and harder to do the kind of films that I wanted to do and find the audience. So I did a film after The Warrior called Far North, which, which just struggled to get you know, seen, struggled to get shown. 
It took years to make. It was really tough. Again, I made a film in, in, in the Arctic, in the North Pole, living on a Russian icebreaker. You know, and it's man, a fantastic kind of film. Experience. But hardly anyone saw it. That was the problem, you know. It was really tough to, to, to get people to buy into it. And it was around that time when we had our first kid. My wife was pregnant, and I just thought, the films that I want to make, these sort of epic films, I, I'm away a lot. I didn't want to be away so much when we had a child. So it was around that time the opportunity to make Senna came along. And I guess that's where my other passions come in. So I love world cinema and I love travel and I love the idea of making epic screens, movies for the big screen in a kind of almost old fashioned way. But I also love sport. So when Senna came along, it was like, well, I do love this battle of how do you show what it's like to be that guy having a rivalry? And so that's when, and just generally, The Sheep Thief was a, a, a short film made by a student, made on the other side of the world with street kids. So the idea of kind of breaking the rules and pushing the boundaries is something that I just love doing. So with the Senna, the idea, big, sometimes you only need a simple idea, but you're just going to have to follow it through. With Senna, the simple thing was, we watched it the other day during lockdown. We watched Sunset Boulevard. The idea that the story is being narrated by someone who's not around. So Senna was the idea of making a film about a character who's going to narrate the story, but I can't meet him or interview him because he's already dead. But I want you to forget he's dead and I want you to go on his journey with him. And whatever he feels, you feel. So the idea of making a documentary very much like a fiction film where the central character, the main protagonist, I want you to be all in. I want you to feel Brazilian. I want you to feel like you're in the car with him and his rival is your rival. In this case, Alan Prost. Right? I'm not trying to be even. I'm not trying to say, you know, but let's hear the other side. No, when you're making a fiction film, you don't say, well, why don't we see this now from the bad guy's point of view? You know, there's a reason why you tell a story and you want the audience to get emotionally invested. So Senna was done in the style of a fiction film. And I felt by looking at, by looking at all the footage of him, I just had an instinct. It's all here. There's a movie here. And there's a movie here that can be done in a way that is much more original than the classic way of doing a documentary. You interview someone, a bit of footage, interview someone. Oh, that's boring. And everyone, everyone involved in a film said, you can't do that. That's not a doc. And I was like, I think, I think it's more interesting that they go, no, we don't want interesting. We want a doc. That's what they do. I had a big fight to do something different. It was not easy. You know, it's not easy to be different, but it's got to pay off. It's got to work. And at the time, you know, Senna took a long time because people didn't really understand. And also the question is, well, what do you do? If you've not gone off and interviewed anyone, why do we need a director? Because that's the vision, the vision. You know, I'm not on a fiction film. I'm not always holding the camera. I'm not literally flying the plane, you know. I'm not actually even there sometimes because there's a second unit, you know. Their idea that directors have to be somehow shot, have to have shot the material themselves was this old-fashioned idea. But now that's changed. Senna changed the doc industry massively. There's pre-Senna and there's post-Senna. You know, the idea of just having boring talking heads now, people just can't do it anymore. They are very much more, they're trying to be more creative about how do you tell the story and feel the story and not to be afraid at the time when the world was going really digital, I went backwards to kind of using archive because for me, it's more like shooting on film. It's imperfect. And that texture makes you believe what's going on much more, I think. But the, also the archive that you, you have for that film is incredibly rich. And, and to, to place that, they, they, they're not really a trilogy, to, but to place that alongside Amy and then Maradona, it's interesting how each is unique in their own way. Amy, obviously, I, I, I wouldn't even want to consider the headaches that you might have had dealing with all the situation there, but then you move on to Maradona, where the easiest thing would have been to say, I'm going to give you a whole biography, but instead you, you posit the film at this one point of him going to Napoli to play, and then you kind of spin a weave around that, which, which is really fascinating. So each of these films, you, you've, it's not that you've done the same thing over and over again. It, it feels like not, finding yeah. different ways to explore. <clears throat> yeah, you know, it's, it's all about finding different ways to tell the story and, and for the character and the technology and the footage and the idea are all, they're, they're all different. You know, with, with Senna, it was me realizing this sport, Formula One exists for, through advertising. Because of advertising, they have to film everything because that's how you get your money's worth. That's how they make their money. So th there's all of these shots, you know, in, in, in terms of sport, technology is being pushed 
um, and cameras are being used in a way that no one else had thought of because that's what Formula One is all about, pushing technology. And then you've got this amazing rivalry. So that was an action film. It was an all-out action film with a spiritual element. And it's important to mention, actually, the reason I got the job for Senna was because of The Warrior. It's because of the spiritual element in The Warrior that one of the producers said, what about him? Because he understands that side. And Senna's spirituality was so important. They didn't want it to just be a racing car film. They did want to understand the character and the character's motivations. And there is a magical realism in there. And you know, Irfan is the only one who's ever said this. He said when he saw... Um, when he saw Senna for the first time, he thought that is one of your films because of the way rain is used. And he remembered the sheep thief where the character when does magic, but is it sleight of hand or can he actually do magic? And he says, I can make the sky cry. I can make it rain. And in Senna, whenever he's in desperate trouble, it starts to rain. And when it rains, he can go faster and everyone else slows down. And there was this idea of like the heavens and God playing a part in his career right up to the very ending, the climax. And so this idea of spirituality was, so the warrior and, and um, Senna and the sheep thief are very much so linked. With, with um, Amy, the, the key thing I wanted to do with Amy was this idea of the kind of honesty and the rawness of the character and telling the story. But particularly what we're doing right now, the whole thing in Amy is that she looks down the lens at the audience, you know, which is one of the basic rules in fiction. Never look at the camera, right? You're not supposed to, you always look off. You know, because that would put the audience off. You shouldn't break that rule. But actually, in Amy, the very first shot, she sings down the lens to her friends. And then later on, her first manager, Nick, is holding the camera and she sings to him and flirts with him. And then later on, it will be her boyfriend. And then it will be her father who's holding the camera. And then it will be the paparazzi. And then the camera from being her friend becomes violent. And she is literally attacking her at one point. And so that journey and that relationship of her and the lens and performing to the camera was the kind of visual idea and then the simple thing was putting her lyrics on screen so the job of the director when for me is always sometimes it's really simple ideas which you follow through but i spend a lot of time thinking about them everyone knew the songs but no one really knew the songs so what i'm going to do is i'm going to tell you something you already know and i'm going to then give it a meaning which is the lyrics of the albums that everyone already had heard or danced to or bought and thought these are jolly aren't they i, I don't want to go to rehab no no, no. you know what all that means that song is a cry for help and so it was just this idea, and very much done in the style of a Bollywood Indian musical. In India, the Bollywood films release the songs first. The songs become massive hits. Then they join them together because the songs are the narrative. And then you get the movie and people go again to see the film knowing the songs and they sing along to the songs. So with Amy, I was thinking of it that way of, this is this one where you already know the, you know the lyrics already. Now I'm gonna tell you the story. And, and then because she's so personal in the way she writes, every song was about her and about her, her love and her desperation and her heartbreak, et cetera. So that was that. With Maradona, it was a different thing. Maradona was more about how do you tell the story of someone who's older? How do you tell the story of someone who's a very unreliable witness? And how do you tell the story? Because in Senna and Amy, there were very obvious antagonists. There were very obvious people that were creating the tension and the drama and the problems. Maradona, I never quite figured out, well, who's the, pro is it him, is it her, is it this person, that person, is it that coach, is it that? No, what if it's all him? No one can tell him what to do. So then it became a more challenging film. So number one, he's still alive and he's meant to be very tricky and difficult. But number two, this is all internal. So it's literally him versus him. And so the idea of football being a game of two sides, first half, second half, blue team, red team, Diego, Maradona, good guy, bad guy, devil, genius, this, that was the whole idea for this film was it's the same person, but everything is him and which version of him. And, you know, it's, it's the success of the film. I mean, another, he died this year. It's been a mad year. Um, the success of the film is in a way that now everyone just uses example of Sen, uh, Diego and Maradona as like, that's a given now. You know, before the film, no one really talked like that. But I've seen, you know, Jurgen Klopp say, I've seen Jose Mourinho say, I've seen footballers talk about it and I'm seeing journalists use it as just like you know that's the way you describe this Diego and this Maradona he was really nice but he was uh, the, the kind of ego so the success of the film I think is the fact that that has just become common parlance now of how you think of him. So so just thinking um, you've got these these films um, far north uh, the documentary films far north um, going back to the warrior and sheep thief um, 
just looking back over the last 20 years, and I know you've talked about the way that technology has changed, um, but just in terms of, of British cinema, um, and it's a weird thing to talk about anyway, because when we talk about British cinema, you, it isn't separate from everything else, because as you said, every filmmaker is influenced by other films from all around the world. Um, yeah. But do you feel the, the changes over the course of the last 20 years have, have sort of been for the better within the British culture of filmmaking? Which I, I think, know is a very big question. It is a big question. It's a good question. I think there has been a changing of the guard. I feel that my generation of filmmakers who I knew a lot of them from making short films and meeting them at short film festivals are kind of coming through um, more and more. But what we had before, um, when I was starting out was like, and they're still going many of them, but the kind of real top end A-listers of like Ridley Scott and people like that, people who were the big end, big, budget making films that you know talk about timeless when you look at Blade Runner or you look at anything that Ridley did in his early years um, and you had kind of the guys who came out of the commercials industry in the 60s 70s 80s who then became these big studio guys um, then you had the mid-ground and then you had the people like you know whether it's Mike Lee, Ken Loach, Winterbottom and people like that later on who just every year made a film made a film made a film made a film it's going to be in Cannes it's going to be in Venice it's going to win the Golden Palm you know that that kind of generation that there is a changing it seems like they're making fewer and fewer films um there is a new kind of arm coming through there's a new kind of um british cinema coming out um whether or not i've seen any of the younger kind of new generation kind of getting to the very 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 top i suppose there are a few people um who've made you know big studio films but what i remember thinking before it was very much all about appealing to the us um, it still kind of is, but now we've got the industry's changed, right? You know, we, we, we've got, you've got the streamers. And so it's very different. Um, there are more films I feel being made. There is more money out there than ever before. Writers are definitely back in fashion. You know, it's about writing a series. I have a problem. I've got to be honest. I am now one of those old guys from that generation where I love a two hour movie anytime over a 50 hour series. That takes three seasons just to get interesting. Um, I just think they're all too long for me. I'm just like, they just go on too long. You look at it and go, that could have been great if it'd been three hours long, but why did it have to be 12 hours long? So I'm not, I'm not the audience yet. I still am not sold on how much of my life I have to invest in a TV series. That may be brilliant, but I just don't have the time. So, so I get bored. You know, the whole thing about everything I've ever done, part of the reason I switch genre or switch styles is because I get bored making the same thing again. Why do I want to watch someone else making the same thing again and again? Um, so it's, I'm kind of giving a long-winded answer because it's relevant to my last film. When I made Maradona, after Amy, because Amy was a massive hit all over the world, it won, it made a lot of money, it won a lot of awards. Before I'd made Maradona, people, all the streamers were saying, we won it. We will, how much do you want? What it, we, we, we want this film un, unseen, unmade. And I said no. And the reason I thought about it a long time. The reason I said no was I had a feeling in 2015 16 that this just might be the last film that I made. There's just something that I could see the industry was changing. And every film I've made, I've been trying to be aware of the industry and how the industry is going in parallel to your own filmmaking career and just how long it takes to make a movie. By the time you start a film and finish a film, the industry's changed. The people in charge of change. So you've got to kind of think about that and be aware of it. So I said, I really wanted Maradona because it's about an Argentinian, because it's about Napoli. I want it to be seen on a big screen in those countries and in England and not just be seen on TV. It will eventually end up on TV. I know more people could see it on TV, but I wanted it to be seen. And I didn't know 2020 was going to come along. I didn't know cinemas were going to be shut down, but I just had an instinct. So 2019, the film premiered at Cannes. I went around the world traveling with Diego Maradona. You know, he's now sadly died. So it was like the last thing that he kind of did and the last film that I've made where I got to travel with it and see it with an audience and hear the audience react and have open air screenings in football stadiums. And now there's no movies, you know, there's like hardly anyone is shooting. Cinemas are being shut. We can't go out. And who's jumped in while that's been happening? The streamers, Disney, Warner Brothers, HBO, Netflix, everyone, Apple. They're like, we're in, you know, you couldn't design something better 
to make cinema struggle than what's been happening in the last year. So I think it's going to change even more again in the next few years because in one way, more films are being made. The problem is, is anyone seeing them? You know, if you don't, and for me, the collective experience of cinema is one of the joys of cinema. Being in an audience, being with strangers, watching a film on a big screen, in a dark room, without my phone, because I'm not very good. I will sit there while I'm watching. I am watching. You know, I'm one of those, I'm a human. You know, they're designed to distract. So it's a long-winded answer, but I feel like in one hand, more filmmakers are going to get their work seen made. I think fewer people are having a collective experience. I have not seen Small Axe yet, but from everything I'm seeing and hearing, Steve McQueen's new series of films is meant to be some of the greatest art, you know, of this year. But because it's been on TV, I've still got to psychologically get around to saying I've got to watch those five films. Um, and I think that he's, he's really seems like, I mean, in one LA film critics last night for best film, even though they didn't enter it. I don't know if you know this, it'd be no man land, uh, even though it wasn't entered. The, the jury decided, wow. the critics in LA said, this is the best thing. We're going to give it the award for best, best movie of the year, even though it's five short films made for TV. So I think he's, he's probably doing something. And he's one of the filmmakers, I think, that's pushing it. And I'm hoping people from different class, people from diverse backgrounds are the new generation of British cinema. Because it definitely when I started, that was very white. Um, it may be working class and middle class, but it was very much a certain kind of Oxbridge group that were deciding who makes films. And I'm hoping that's about to change or is in the process of changing now. We keep our fingers crossed, although uh, the one thing you said just then, and I, I, I think once we get over the situation that we're in now, I, I still think that deep down there's going to be a lot of people who want to be in that place with people they don't know, all laughing together, all being frightened together, all feeling suspenseful together. And I think that's the one I thing. Hope so. I does. just hope people are not going to get really lazy. <laughs> that's the problem. People are lazy and, and you know, the, and psychologically, I think people have been affected. It's true, but I think the pressure is now on you guys to produce the work that will make us want yeah. to go back into the cinema. And that's yeah. the, the danger is if the money's all coming from streamers, they don't want it to go to the cinema. I, yep, we, we shall wait and see. I mean, Netflix is showing more of their films in the cinema, admittedly only a week or two before it comes on to streaming, yeah. but it's, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. But it's obviously- It's not their this, business model. It's not their business model. And, and, and you know, when we, my own experience of it was, what they would say is, yeah, we'll do a campaign. So we'll put it on a big screen to campaign for awards. Yeah. But does that mean showing a film in Argentina or in Italy or in somewhere, you know? No, that's not a campaign, is it? And I think that's the challenge. But more people will see it. So it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult thing um, to balance. I'm, I'm still figuring it out like everyone else, you know, I'm still working out because in the meantime, you've just got to come up with, well, what's your next project and who will pay for it? And what kind of rules do I want to break next? And what, how about, what kind of boundaries do you want to push? Um, and therefore who is the potential financier who understands the vision of what you're trying to do? All of that is in the mix. You know, it's, it's, it's good times, but it's also tough times. And I think, um, what I hope is that filmmakers, artists, musicians, use everything that's going on to create interesting challenging work you know that's that's what we've got to do definitely and well thank you very much for joining us today asif thanks Ian. it's good been talking. a pleasure chatting to you you take care you too